Welcome to the Business Vitality Podcast. My name is Katherine Canty. I am the host and an executive coach. I work with teams, individuals, and leaders to help create measured leadership change. We do that using practical applications, and our clients are creating 100% measured results as seen by those around them. Not necessarily what I think or what they think, but what the other people are seeing. And they are being recognized for the hard work that they're doing. If you're interested in learning more about some of the work that we're doing, you can learn more at KatherineCanty.com. I would love for you to subscribe to this show, to Business Vitality. This is my way to continue to pay it forward and share business best practices. Stay tuned and listen to the interview. Thanks for being here. Natalie Ruiz, you are the CEO of Answer Connect, found on the web at AnswerConnect.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I know I've enjoyed our our pre-chat before we got in. So I just, I love your energy and I love um, some of these topics that we're talking about. And so before we kind of get in to what we were talking about before that I'd like to get more into, I want to just kind of step back and, and ask you at a real high level, Natalie, tell me about Answer Connect and what services are you providing? I'd be happy to. So Answer Connect is a people-powered solution that helps small businesses. So the the core of the business since the early 2000s has been virtual reception. So what happens when the phone rings for your business and you're with a client, you're having dinner, you're on the road, whatever that case is, we make sure that it's a live, professional, amazing answer every single time. And that's been the base. But over the years, as small businesses have also changed and started working in different places, we started developing software to help those small businesses work from anywhere. And so that means a whole suite of tech solutions that help them stay connected to their business, answer web chats, call folks back, connect with their remote teams now that so many of us are working remotely. Um, and it's I've always thought of it as kind of a, a business solution in a box, like that one-stop shop that can take a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, a small business, and really help them scale. I love that. I, w- I went on your site and I was just chatting with you before and you have fun videos of working with a human versus a robot. And I believe the characters' names are Sally and Roberta. Is that yes, right? Yes. Will you talk about these two characters that you have YouTube channels on? I think it's just so, entertainment to watch because we can all relate. So this is a really big deal. So when we talk about virtual reception, unfortunately, Sometimes we're thinking AI, sometimes we're thinking bots. But what I would say is when you pick up the phone, you do have an expectation for getting that problem solved or that question answered and a robot or Roberta in this case, they just miss the mark consistently. And so we made a pledge, real people, not bots. That has been an initiative of ours since before we made a video about it, but kind of putting it out there that people are the answer humans are the answer. Technology is the foundation that you can build a lot of amazing things on top of. But when I'm talking with somebody, when I'm trying to solve a problem, if I'm trying to book an appointment, whatever the case is, I think we've all had that experience of yelling into the phone, like talk to a real person or pressing zero over and over to try to get there. And so we made kind of a fun video. You should check it out um, for anybody who's listening who hasn't, but just kind of speaks to those pain points of trying to get it done with a bot. It, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't. Tell me about like, how do you get, how do you find people who can answer the phone? Because, you know, sometimes we're not all being raised the same way when mm-hmm. we used to have to look at people in the eye and be able to shake hands and have those communication skills. So uh, how are you finding these people and, and training these folks that are in the virtual reception area? It's such a good question. And I'll tell you more than 10 years ago, I read a book that changed the whole way that I looked at this and it was called the Nordstrom way. And if you've ever walked through a Nordstrom or bought something at a Nordstrom, you know, that that experience is usually top notch. And they were asked, how do you find these people? And they said, you hire the smile, you train the skill. Like you can train somebody how to sell shoes, use your point of sale system, do all of those technical things but you can't train somebody to be a kind person or to be a person who cares about solving problems for others. And I I think the same has been true for us. 
we can train folks on using our software, using our tech, how to help our customers. But the core is to really find people who are aligned with wanting to be problem solvers, who get lit up when they get to help another human. And I think that is, it's really predicated on us knowing who we are and knowing what those secrets to success are and then hiring for it. Um, you know, really searching for that, putting a lot of detail in our job advertisements. And we even have some videos that will show, you know, maybe the good, the bad, and the ugly of being in customer service, because the, the you know, the bad slash ugly is that people don't always pick up the phone to just tell you that, you know, you're amazing, you rock, high five. They call you because something's wrong. And we see that some of our applicants self-select out. They're like, ooh, I don't know if I want to do that. And that's actually great. That's amazing for them to have that awareness and just know that that's not the right fit for them. That's um, pretty smart to be able to show what a bad day looks like as you're looking at a job. So you can consider, okay, we know what what this is going to look like if it goes well, but what does a bad day look like? And, and is that still okay with me? And you're right. They can self-select out. That's a brilliant idea. Um, making sure that you're aligning the right people with the right position. Quite smart. Well, it's really easy for me to tell you or anyone else all of the amazing things about working with us. And mm -hmm. we found that we were really caught up in that. And everybody was super excited and they loved onboarding and they loved training. And then, yeah, you get one of those tough days and they didn't love it. And that wasn't even in their map of what could happen. So we're, we're trying to do better when it comes to that. Okay. So you just said a word that I picked up on, which is onboarding. And mm -hmm. a lot of folks are, are going through this great resignation and then this great rehire through just people are moving around different organizations mm -hmm. or moving out for one reason or another. And, you know, we haven't ever, I don't think it was a common word in corporate America, which is onboarding training and making sure that mm -hmm. you have given them all the right tools. And I think in the past, it was considered you give them a password, you give them their, their badge to get in and out of the building, you give them a cell phone and a laptop and you check off the box and you're done, like you should know how to do the job. But it sounds like with you and, and the, the service that you're delivering, there might be a little bit more to it. Do you mind talking about that? I would love to. And actually really quickly. So I started with the company 16 years ago and I was a temp to hire. I was an entry-level employee. And I'll tell you, first impressions stick with a person. And my first impression of my company was really bumpy because there wasn't any onboarding. I was sent off to kind of forage for my own headset. Finding a desk felt like a game of musical chairs and I didn't get the warm fuzzies. I actually didn't really even know what the company did. I just knew that I was in this place and I had to have a headset. I had to clock in and clock out. So what kind of loyalty or affinity do I have to that work? Not much. In fact, I told the staffing agency to find me something else. The lucky thing was I had a chance to make a second impression, which was getting to know some folks, getting to learn a lot more about the culture and how I could play a part in that. And I think that's always stuck with me as a really important piece of this. Think about when you invite somebody into your home for dinner. You don't necessarily just like point to the refrigerator and point to the restroom and say, you know, here's where we're going to eat. You might show them around. You might show them your yard. You might talk to them about some personal details. And I think about the same thing when you onboard a person to your company. You know, the goal is that they're going to stay, that they're going to love it, and that they're going to become part of who you become next as an organization. And so with that, we invest some time. Um, we do everything virtually. We're a remote first company these days. And it's amazing because 10 or 15 years ago, I don't think that we would be talking about meeting people and training people and onboarding them through video and virtually. But I think it actually feels very connected. We've got folks who are in a video call with each other, a small class for two weeks. They've got a trainer and they meet a lot of different people from all different departments in the company during that. So there's technical things to learn, but there's a lot of culture and mission that we want to infuse. And we also want them to know some people when they get done with the training, because I think that's key. And especially in a remote environment, we are missing out on those spontaneous moments where you might be grabbing more coffee, walking out to your car at the end of the shift, riding the elevator together. And so we engineer them um, and we build a pathway for them to know people and stay connected with them after they're done with training and starting their regular day-to-day -day job. Um, so that onboarding, it's a really fragile time because I think 
most of us have an internal monologue and we're asking ourselves questions like, you know, can I really do this? Do I want to actually do this? Are these my people? Do I like this job? And, and on and on. And so curating that experience to help them get that impression is just it, there's a business case for it when it comes to retention and success. And I also think it's the right thing to do. I would agree with you. It's the right thing to do. And it, it sounds like you lead this with a lot of intention of, um, of how are we going to impact this? And I think when you talk about, it's almost shifting the mindset and thinking about this differently and putting yourself in those other people's shoes that are new to the company and, you know, what is that? They're already nervous. If you think about it, you know, when you're, when I'm first day on the job, it's, it's nerve wracking and relationships are going to be extremely important throughout this. And then you add a remote layer on there. Um, it, it just all gets very tricky and mm -hmm. sounds like with intention and with processes and setting up these relationships with people, it allows you to even bring them in further quicker and on board faster and more efficient is what it sounds like. It feels that way to us. I mean, certainly we've had many, many iterations and we're probably not done, but yeah, I think the, the intention and continually checking in on what's working and what's not working. So with the knowledge that it's not like, you know, check mark, nailed it, we're done. We never have to think of a new way to do this, but also meeting people where they are. You mentioned the great resignation. We are living and working in a really challenging time and a time that, a lot of our workforce has never seen or, or lived or worked through anything like this. So I think there's an aspect when you want to connect with people in, in meeting them where they are, understanding that and speaking to it. There's a lot of gold in there. Um, we could talk about this for a while, but I'm kind of curious because you lit up when we talked about this other topic before I hit record. Um, you mentioned the book, The Nordstrom Way, about hiring with a smile, mm -hmm. train for the skill. Um, I've noticed online, as I was looking at, at some of your information, you talk about the book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And um, you say that, um, you know, just personal growth and leadership and this consistency, this is like what I'm seeing um, with you and your brand and your company. And you share about this book on your website and, and how that um, really has a lot of power around the mindset. And I wanted to here you talk a little bit about the book mindset and Carol Dweck's work around emotional mm -hmm. intelligence and, and just the overall, you know, growth mindset. So I'm going to open it up because it sounds like you have a lot of wonderful, um, wonderful thoughts around that, that, that yeah. world. Thank you. Carol Dweck's book was groundbreaking in the way that I thought of things. So I, I'll confess, I grew up and in a lot of the circles and a lot of the classrooms I was in, I was the smart kid the talented kid. And so you like that. And that, if you've read the book, can perpetuate actually some not so great thinking and behaviors because you want to maintain that title. And so you might be afraid to take on things that you're going to fail because that really speaks to what Carol discusses as a fixed mindset. Well, if I am smart, then I have to continue to always succeed at things. Otherwise I am not smart. Like that is my identity. Whereas the growth mindset is understanding that most things can be learned, that failure is part of this. So it was groundbreaking for me to kind of recognize some of these tendencies in myself and work backward and say, oh my gosh, that's what was going on as a mom to think about how I encourage my kids instead of saying, wow, you're so smart saying things like, wow, you're such a hard worker, encouraging that behavior. Um, as a leader, we are really big on learning. It's one of our core values. And we've actually built an online university where our employees all get paid learning time and they can access any learning that they would like, whether it's directly related to their job or whether it maybe someday could be. And that is with this knowledge that a growth mindset, most things can be learned. And if you wanna get better at math, if you wanna get better at graphic design, if you wanna get better at leadership skills, it's all there. And so we've invested in it. And what we've seen is more engagement, better retention, growth, a lot of internal promotions and people who get excited about learning. Um, I thought that I was a voracious reader for, you know, my whole life until I started thinking about, well, how many books does that actually equate to? And it was maybe still more than average, but now that we have dedicated 30 minutes per day learning time for most of us, 
And I do audiobooks because I can do that while I'm walking or cooking or cleaning or driving or doing any of the other things. I'm, I'm getting through so many more conversations, so many more ideas. And so there's a personal benefit to me leveling up. But the real magic comes when somebody on my team has also read or listened to that book and we're discussing how to solve a problem. And suddenly we are using shared language that came from this learning. And that that for me was the key that made me decide that we have to keep doing this because suddenly you're talking about concepts that neither of you knew six months ago. Do you have a certain book that the company all reads at one time or how, how are you doing that? So in the early, early days of this, it's funny. So all, all of these ideas have been iterative. So yes, long ago, the whole company, everybody got the book and we all read it. And sometimes we would like go on a walk and talk about it, or we would share like the YouTube video we've grown and we've scaled and we're, we're large and different people have different interests. So we do have individual like book clubs where groups will read it together. Some folks aren't into audiobooks or even like long form, and they might do Ted talks. They might do talks at Google or talks at Stanford. It's an amazing time to be a learner because there's so much available online. Um, But what we do have built into that online university is where we share our takeaways. And so that is kind of a a transparent conversation. And that speaks to sharing what we learn, which is another one of our core values. And so that keeps that conversation going. And you, you end up solidifying more of what you know when you share your takeaways. I would agree completely. And then... I've got a few questions just <laughs> listening to this. So I hope I'm just going to kind of chase this for a minute. Um, you said that you have dedicated reading time, 30 minutes per day for the mm-hmm. team members. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about that? And, and it sounds like time management is a, is a vital piece within the business to be able to allocate the 30 minutes and to be able to execute on that um, and to be able to log in your thoughts or your takeaways mm-hmm. is also a, a, a learned behavior. Um, of a, of a growth mindset probably. So do you mind talking about just the time management aspect of it? Sure. So, so as a business that predominantly does virtual reception, there's a contact center aspect to this. So there's scheduling, there's stats, there's calls coming in, there's work to do. And so that was a bit of a hurdle to overcome. How do we make this work for team members whose work is so heavily kind of monitored and stat driven? And We have an amazing team who came up with ways to make this work and essentially would allocate separate shifts that are for learning. So separate shifts that they, so we do a lot of self-scheduling, um, (laughs) big on crowdsourcing, big on letting people solve these problems for themselves because they're going to know what they want. And so every two weeks, our team members will choose when they work and we're a 24 seven, 365 business. So there's a lot of choices and then they'll choose when they take their learning and that's just built in. So they're taking calls, they're doing their work, they're meeting with their leaders and then it's time for their learning shift. And they put themselves in that status. We have transparency. So we kind of know what folks are up to and then they'll be able to, whether they're taking that time to read or to watch a video or to work on something that corresponds with the learning, um, that's all there and it's pretty transparent but we know that it's built in. Um, For me, my job is a little bit less stat driven, a little bit less transparent, but truly in order for me to consistently get my learning time in, I have to put it on my calendar. Otherwise it's like that thing gets, and I tell myself stories like, oh, I'll do it after dinner. Oh, I'll do it when I, and it's like going to the gym. If you don't put it on your calendar, maybe it doesn't happen that day. I love that. There's so much truth in that. And there's um, some certain folks that I'm working with right now where we're talking about this and like, Mm -hmm. we tell ourselves these stories, I will do it later. And um, it is like going to the gym and it's hard to believe that this could all be that simple of scheduling it and holding yourself accountable. It's, you know, simple, I would say with big air quotes, because it took a lot to get here but it's about the culture as well. It's like having that accountability partner for the gym or the workout or the walk that you're going to do. When it's part of the culture, when it's expected and when everyone's doing it, that helps. Um, The other thing that helps is we talk about our learning. So we've also got, I think there are usually about 10 minute group video call meetings. And what's really cool about this is that people from all different departments. So I could pop into one, one of our contact center employees could pop into one, an HR person and on and on 10 minutes, you jump in and you share what you've been learning this week. And so 
it's again, an affirming practice. You don't want to not be able to go because you haven't been doing anything with your learning time. Uh, and you want to make sure that you have something that's kind of interesting to share. And so there's a lot of different ways I think that you can reinforce the habit and, and that helps it be, you know, quote unquote, simple. Well, and you're right. We should put it in air quotes as far as simple, <laughs> because it, it's just not easy to be able to do this stuff. And um, it sounds like also something that you're very intentional with is, is the culture and the environment that all of these remote um, remote first team members are in. Mm -hmm. How long has culture been in the front of mind and how has that been like? Because I think from what I can tell is culture should have always been there, but I feel like with the shift of the workforce, mm -hmm. people are going to really elevate it who never have elevated this yeah. before. And that's going to separate you from everybody else because you've been doing that. So could you talk about that? Yes. So I will say back in, you know, the olden days, the early days, I think culture was just what happened because we were small, we were small and we were co-located and there were maybe 30 employees around the time that I started. So culture was made up of who was there and what we all kind of naturally talked about. And that was just like a byproduct of the people. And that was okay. But you start to see behaviors or traits or actions that aren't right for you. But you don't, if you don't have a really intentional culture, then I don't think that you have the language to for sure identify it. And so it, again, was iterative to kind of say like, is that who we are? Is that who we want to be? When we went to remote work, I think that's when we had to get really serious because suddenly you're not running into each other at the break room. Suddenly you're not taking a walk to go grab lunch together. A lot of those moments don't exist. And so you have to think about who do you want to be? How do you want to show up and what's really important? And also like what's okay and what's not okay when you work here. Um, I, I remember reading a quote or hearing a talk where somebody said, you know, your work culture isn't what the CEO says it is. It's not what you have on a poster on the wall. Your work culture is what people are going to tell their friends and family when they're at the pub after work. Mm -hmm. And somebody says, you know, what is it like to work there? Or what is it like to work with that person? You're hoping that they say some of the things that you would want to put on the poster or that, you know, that the leaders want to say, but I think it's being intentional in that way. And what I found is cultivating a space where people feel psychologically safe, which means they can speak up, they can disagree, they can bring ideas forward. Um, and it creates a more creative space, more innovation. And I think that's a huge part of our culture that's been essential for this remote model to really thrive. Because again, anybody can bring an idea forward. And a lot of times they're going to be closer to the problem or to the problem to solve than, than I would be. That has helped us stay, I think, innovative and on the cutting edge of finding better solutions. And so, again, there's a there's a really linear business reason to do it. And also, we're going to spend 30% of our lives working. That's the stat that I've seen. I don't want to be a different person at work than I am when I'm with you know my friends and family. And I don't want to have to feel like I'm sacrificing one for the other. I want it to be integrated. And for me, that means creating a culture where we can enjoy each other, enjoy the environment and feel like we have an opportunity to thrive together. I think that's beautiful. Um, so you're, it, you're growing people, you're growing the business, but then you're also growing others. And um, part of growing, you know, the others kind of outside the business mm -hmm. is trees. You have planted yes. over a million trees. I find this fascinating. <laughs> and I love that you're giving back in creative ways. Do you mind talking about your trees? Yes, I would love to talk about trees. So our, our core values are learning, sharing, and giving back. And we've talked about learning and sharing so far. So here we are giving back again in the early, early days. This has always been who we are. In fact, I can remember organizing volunteer outings for our team. We've always wanted to be involved in our local communities. We've always wanted to leave a positive impact even beyond the services that we provide. And so we would organize these outings and trees. It's funny the way they came about. I'll tell you, there is an organization here in Portland, Oregon, that is local to us that they plant trees. And so when we were kind of co-located in Portland, we went out and I have to admit, I thought it was going to be this really cute volunteer thing. So I put on my cute rubber boots and I thought I was going to get like a photo with a small sapling and we were going to do this great work and then go get pizza after. 
I was not prepared for how hard <laughs> it is to dig holes and plant real trees. I was covered in mud, like up to my hips. I had blisters and I thought, these trees are probably not going to survive because none of us are professionals. <laughs> like this is terrible. My team was tired, sore and looking at me like, really, Natalie, this is what we're up to. <laughs> we we've always wanted to leave our planet a little bit better than we found it. And as a remote company, we started to see how there were possibilities to become totally paperless, to recycle, to not need as much real estate as we'd had, to not have to heat and cool a building that people just drove into every day, to reduce emissions from those drives. And so trees were kind of a natural leap. And so we've partnered with different organizations. I'm so grateful. I don't have to dig the holes anymore and the trees <laughs> are in much, much better hands, but globally partnered with orgs that will go around and plant the right types of trees in places that really need them. And so we make a monthly donation and we donate based on every single one of our customers and every single one of our employees. So we're all part of this and we do it monthly. And sometimes with crazy ideas, they seem really wacky until they don't. And I think crossing that million tree mark is like, oh, wow, now you're doing something meaningful. But I've got to tell you the first month that we told our clients that we were planting a tree in their honor, they didn't necessarily have their socks knocked off on that number, uh, but it gains momentum. And I, I think everybody is really excited about doing this. It, it has stuck and over 1.1 million trees have been planted, which I think is phenomenal. And I love that there's a way for you to give back. I love how I didn't even plan this, but it worked <laughs> out. You know, you talked about learning, sharing and giving back and those, <laughs> I love to be able to talk about it because that's what you need in business today. It, it's just this whole picture. Um, and, you know, as we kind of start to wrap up a little bit, I also saw mm -hmm. that you're giving back through the, um, to the Ukraine crisis relief fund. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I, I didn't know if you wanted to say a few words about that as well. Definitely. So we're, we're a global community, we're a global company and the, the situation happening in Ukraine has been in all of our hearts and on all of our minds. We have so many families, so many employees, so many people impacted and to sit back and, and see it unfolding, we, we felt compelled to do something. And there's, I wanna say there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of situations in the world and it is tough to choose which you're going to take part in. And that can be tough as an organization, as a business. Um, but in this case, because of the magnitude of how many of our folks have been deeply and personally impacted. We felt called to help. We also aren't always big on helping by just writing a check, but when we did our research into how we might make the most impact, we ended up creating a donation, giving a donation ourselves to uh, an organization that was helping children. And then we set up a GoFundMe with matching so that we could um, intensify the, the impact. Thank you for what you're doing. I think it's it's wonderful how you're 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 giving back, obviously, but but you're able to do that because you're learning yourself and you're teaching others how to learn and you're sharing that. And um, I think the impact of that just kind of continues to ripple, and that's what is going to make you different and continue to allow you to grow in in a world that seems that we keep going down these algorithms and programs and technology paths, which are wonderful, mm -hmm. but we need humans and um, we need a, a few more Sally's and maybe not as many Roberta's <laughs> when it comes to virtual receptions. So um, I love how you're, you brought this all together. And um, I wanted to, to ask a last question, you know, if someone is listening and they want to be able to take a next step with you, or they're curious mm -hmm. and want to be able to learn more, um, what's the best way to learn more about what you're doing and the services you're providing? Well, I would say that the first and best solution is to go to our website, answerconnect.com. You can register for more information there. You can speak with team members. Um, you can reach out to me if it's not that you directly necessarily want to partner with Answer Connect, or at least not yet, because I think most people should. You can connect with me on LinkedIn as well. It's Natalie S. Ruiz at LinkedIn. Um, but Answer Connect is going to talk about our giving back initiatives, going to talk about why we do what we do. And then you'll also get to download a, the whole PDF of all of the solutions that we offer our small and mid-sized business clients. Thank you. Natalie Ruiz, you are the CEO of Answer Connect, found on the web at answerconnect.com. Thank you so much for joining us.
Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate you. Thanks for listening to the episode. If you like it, please subscribe, share this episode or this show with other people around you. The greatest form of a compliment is a referral. I really appreciate them. And if you think that you want to learn more about some of the work we're doing, I encourage you to reach out to katherinecanty.com. You can schedule a call or just continue to read articles and information that we post out there. Thank you so much for being here.